Greetings and salutations, Monolithic Ethos here. Today, I'll be continuing off with part two of my response to Second Thought's video in which he makes the outrageous claim that freedom as a political concept derives from left-wing ideals. And by left-wing, he isn't referring to Democrats or progressives, but rather literal socialists or what he perceives as socialists within historical standards. Because nothing says freedom like gulags, breadlines, and delicious dirt cookies. For those who haven't seen part 1 yet, I recommend viewing it before watching this video, which the link will be posted in the description below. Anyway, continuing what I left off, Second Thought attempts to analyze the evolution of the word freedom and how its meaning had changed throughout history. He argues that freedom initially meant popular self-government, aka absolute democracy, and not the let me be connotation that is widely held today. I must point out that this assertion, along with other points that he made in this video, derives from the book Freedom and Unruly History, which I should add, Annalene de Dane, the author of the book and self-proclaimed political historian, has made her career out of claiming libertarians and conservatives had subverted the definition of freedom while simultaneously arguing that COVID lockdowns and vaccine passports don't infringe against individual freedom because it wouldn't infringe against her definition of freedom. But I think people should know there is a virus here. It kills people. And the only way we prevent it is, is to get vaccinated, to wear masks, to do social distancing, washing your hands all the time, and not just to think about, well, my freedom is being kind of disturbed here. No, screw your freedom. Going back to Second Thought's video, in an attempt to prove that freedom as a concept had been tempered by evil right-wingers, cites Aristotle, implying that the Greek philosopher himself thought that the source of liberty comes from democracy and that freedom requires all people to possess equal political power. To be free was to not be a slave. This original definition formed the basis of some of the first formalized political debates for which we have existing records. In other words, freedom transformed from an abstract concept to a political one. And at the core of this transformation were debates animated by two questions. Who gets to be free? And what does that mean? A few answers begin to emerge. For Aristotle, a founding figure in the long history of political theory, freedom has many parts. In democracies specifically, freedom is both one, ruling and being ruled in turn, and two, the ability to live as one wishes without interference from others. These map quite cleanly to the way we still conceptualize freedom today, in negative and positive terms. On his end, Aristotle chose to formulate these freedoms in a political context by making negative freedom, freedom from coercion, tangible with his notion of equal and alternating rule and positive freedom, freedom too, by ensuring one's ability to live as they please. For these conditions to be freedom, the very basis of a democratic society according to Aristotle, it is crucial that people must be equal in their political power. This is the variable that distinguishes democracies from other systems of government. Specifically, democracy is a system of popular sovereignty, in direct contradiction with a society where the more prosperous, the wealthy, can utilize their wealth as political power. Without a base level of equality in power, it is not a democracy. Aristotle argues this by saying that if no one has more power over others to a greater degree than anyone else does, no one is becoming a metaphorical slave to another. Remember that this question of slavery is incredibly central to early politics and the very meaning of liberty. With this theory of freedom, then, Aristotle reassures the people of ancient Greece that simply by creating a political organization, so long as it is democratic and equal, the Greeks have not made themselves slaves to their fellow citizens. On the contrary, government in this sense is emancipatory, not enslaving. To claim that Aristotle thought freedom was some sort of synonym for direct democracy, or even to say that he was an advocate for democracy would be an act of dishonest historical revisionism. The fact that this outright lie came out of the mouth of a YouTuber that started out as one of those educational channels is outright disgraceful. Not only did Aristotle oppose democracy, but also viewed democracy as a pipeline towards tyranny. This was even mentioned in one of Chapman's own sources. Aristotle's dislike for democracy stands on the ground that direct democracy would mean that every person, rich, poor, educated, and ignorant, would have the right and duty to govern. This is not to say that democracy is bad because Aristotle didn't want actual retards to vote or run it for office. Okay, maybe that's a partial reason, but the main concern that Aristotle, Plato, and other Greek philosophers had with direct democracy is the inherent dangers of populist tyranny, commonly referred to as mob rule, which is when the popular majority 
majority is overrepresented in governing the state and using their power to oppress the minority for the sake of their own egotistic interests. For instance, the poor would always outvote the rich and talented and with the power of popular democracy enact laws that violate the freedoms and rights of the minority such as overtaxing the wealthy and the confiscation of private property. Aristotle was also eerie that democracy would enable demagogues to take advantage of the system by exploiting the emotions of the people to obtain absolute power. Granted, Aristotle wasn't a fan of oligarchies either, believing that an oligarchy that rules for the benefit of the super rich or for their own self-interest at the expense of the general public would also lead to tyranny. Clearly, Aristotle was very cautious about egotistic factions from both ends of the social ladder. Taking into account the flaws of the two systems, that being oligarchy and democracy, Aristotle proposed a system that he calls polity, a system of balancing power that is somewhat similar to how modern day Western republics function, in which it relies on a strong middle class to hold leaders accountable to make objective decisions based on statute and not personal ideas or emotion. This is grounded in the idea that a large middle class will help prevent an aristocracy from becoming an oligarchy by balancing the interests of the sovereign. Despite his claim about Aristotle being an outright lie, Second Thought continues on with his demented assertion that freedom is just a valid expression of democracy. Chapman goes on to mention the restoration of Greek thought during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and how the reinsurgence of such ideas paved the way for the Atlantic revolutions. And in that regard, this is probably one of the rare instances of Second Thought being factually thorough. Well, with the exception in regards to Haiti, since he alleged that the Haitian Revolution brought equal status to the formerly enslaved and oppressed people, which disregards the brutal maltreatment of mulattoes, freed wealthy blacks, and Dominicans. However, what really lost me is the accusation that the terminology of freedom had been infiltrated by conservatives into disassociating liberty with democracy, citing the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte. Around the world, revolutionary freedom was demanded and subsequently declared. Unsurprisingly, this frightened the elites. The period of terror that followed the French Revolution gave rise to an anti-democratic discourse that led to democratic repression, notably in the Napoleonic regime. Liberalism and conservatism alike were developed or resurged and came to dominate political discourse, concluding that democracy was ultimately dangerous to freedom, not its most valid expression. I really hope Shabin doesn't become a historian because I had enough of these freaking Marxist grooming zoomers into Stalin simping tankies with their historical revisionism. To start out, to say that the rich elite was somehow terrified by the revolutionary demands for freedom is the most part a loony leftist libel towards the French Revolution. This is due to the fact that the French elite was the dominant driving force of the French Revolution. Particularly the enlightened elites who were dissatisfied with the monarchy, high taxation, and the lack of political rights. This is why intellectuals, including socialist ones, refer to the French Revolution as a bourgeois revolution. Although the Revolutionary Republic ended up dissolving into a military dictatorship led by Napoleon Bonaparte, which fun fact, his name's actually pronounced Napoleon A. Bonaparte, his regime kept many of the enlightened principles of the revolution with the Napoleonic Code. The code reinforces the virtues of equality under the law, religious freedom, and mercantilism all of which are attributes to the core values of the French Revolution and the former French Republic. With Napoleon's conquest of Europe, the Napoleonic Code was enacted upon these conquered territories, giving the West a taste of freedom and the spread of liberty throughout the continent. It even lives on to this very day as the majority of European and American countries have their own civil codes that are directly copied from Napoleon. Second that does make one slight correct point, that being the growing concerns within the revolutionary government over democracy being an inherent threat to the Republic. Liberalism and conservatism alike were developed or resurged and came to dominate political discourse concluding that democracy was ultimately dangerous to freedom, not its most valid expression. Nominally, these debates focused on the protection of the rights of minorities, but in practice, the greatest animating fear for anti-democratic politicians was that democracy opened the door to economic redistribution. In their minds, curtailing democracy was a perfectly legitimate goal if it upheld the safety of the class system. Although his assertion is correct, he deliberately left out one crucial fact. Second thought, can you care to explain where exactly they got the premise that the rights of the minorities should be protected? Who did they get the idea that democracy would undoubtedly lead to self-entitled people enacting wealth distribution and stripping private property? 
I believe you did mention this anti-democratic, fascist, elitist, right-wing philosopher by name. Aristotle separates this freedom from democratic freedom so he can justify his preferred form of government, aristocracy. Wow, thank you, Chapman. I really appreciate exposing your blatant dishonesty. I also want to point out that the gradual straying away from direct democracy was in reality a response to concerns over monarchists exploiting the democratic system to resurrect the previously overthrown monarchical regime. Royalists were still somewhat prevalent in France during the Republican years and already had their political and voting rights denied even before Napoleon took the reign of power. The threat posed by royalists wasn't minimal as there were constant monarchist riots and rebellions that violently provoked the French Republic, most notably the 13th Vimeer Uprising of 1795, which by the way brought Napoleon massive fame as a revolutionary hero for successfully defending the Republic from an attempted violent monarchist takeover. Chapman goes on to state that these right-wing liberal revisionists had reframed freedom away from equality and direct democracy by incorporating individualism. The greatest animating fear for anti-democratic politicians was that democracy opened the door to economic redistribution. In their minds, curtailing democracy was a perfectly legitimate goal if it upheld the safety of the class system. For this to happen, freedom had to be reframed by early liberal thinkers. Away from its origin as self-governance in a society of political equals, freedom became individualized. He fully ignores that individualism was one of the core concepts of Enlightenment thought, dating back to John Locke's theory on individualism. And to claim that individualism was some sort of right-wing subversion of freedom ignores that individualism made its way into leftist thought, most notably from the philosophical works of Lysander Spooner and Max Stirner. Second Thought then places the blame for Jim Crow laws on supposed altered anti-democratic sentiment of freedom. In pseudo-democratic societies, this was achieved by delinking institutions from popular power, or by curtailing it outright with greater state violence. For this sentiment to be catalyzed in the US, Americans had to wait until the abolition of slavery and the Cold War. At the end of the Civil War, democratic disinterest reached its peak among the American elite. Faced with a newly liberated population of black Americans, the idea that freedom belonged to the masses was heavily resisted with a slew of anti-democratic policies intended to curtail the freedom of the formerly enslaved to self-government and self-sufficiency. In its place, economic self-interest became cloaked in the value of freedom. To be free was to be successful, to mind your own business, not to achieve political equality or break down structural impediments to your freedom with the power of the collective. This brushes aside the origins of slavery and segregation and anti-capitalism. George Fitzhugh, the most influential and outspoken intellectual apologist for Southern slavery and white supremacy, was a starch critic of Adam Smith's economic philosophy, free market capitalism, and enlightenment values. In his book, Cannibals All, or Slaves Without Masters, Fitzhugh argues in the defense of slavery on the grounds that capitalism was a threat to the southern way of life. Liberté and political economy forget to encourage free trade, as well as different between localities and different nations. As between individuals of the same towns, neighborhoods, or nations, the nations possess the most skill and capital and commercial enterprise, and cunning gradually absorb the wealth of those nations who possess less of those qualities. Theoretically, the disparities of shadowness of skills and business capacity between nations and individuals would in the commercial and trading war of the wits rob the weak and simple and enrich the strong and cunning. New York and London grow richer rapidly on the fruits of a trade that robs the less commercial and skillful people who would traffic with them. But those worst effects of free trade is that to beget dissenters of opinion, thought, and fashion robs men of their nationality and impairs their patriotism by teaching them to ape foreign manners, affect foreign dress and opinions, and despise what is domestic. The South feels the truth of all this and after a while will begin to understand it. She has been for years earnestly and actively engaging in promoting the exclusive and protective policy and preaching free trade, not interference of governments and let alone but she does not let alone protection by the state government and her established policy and that is the only expedient or constitutional protection it is time for her to avow her change of policy and opinion and to throw adam smith say richard and co in the fire
Although George Fitzhugh had somewhat discredited socialism, favoring a neo-feudalist system in which private property is monopolized among rich white landowners, he held strong sympathies to socialism, calling it the new fashionable name for slavery, and even refers to slavery as the quote-unquote best and most common form of socialism. I might be going off topic by bringing up Fitzhugh and his apologetics of slavery as the subject matter is that regarding segregation and Jim Crow. However, his philosophy and anti-classical liberal stances had directly given rise to the repression of black suffrage and human rights in the southern United States. Anyway, the rest of the Second Thoughts video is him attempting to discredit capitalism as an aspect of freedom while proclaiming the socialist system that had led to widespread misery within the 20th century to be the true embodiment of freedom. But that will be addressed and debunked in part 3. In the meantime, please like and share this video, leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if you haven't done so already, consider subscribing to my channel. Oh, and remember, all commies are bad.